Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Big Daddy Top Hat here. Recently on this channel, we have been looking at multiple Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles beat em ups that were developed by Konami, along with various Marvel vs. Capcom games featuring the X Men. Today, we are going to be marrying up those ideas and take some time to look at the classic X Men arcade beat em up developed by Konami. X-Men the Arcade game is often considered one of the greatest arcade titles of its day, but going one step further than that, is this classic game one of the best beat-em-ups ever made? And the cream of the crop amongst Konami's beat-em-up arcade offerings? Well, let's find out. This ladies and gentlemen is the mad story of X-Men the Arcade game, one of the best ever. Yeah. Our story today starts back in the 19th century, back in 1896. This was the year of the birth of pulp magazines, inexpensive fiction that was published on cheap wood pulp paper. The pulp gave rise to the term pulp fiction, in reference to run-of-the-mill low-quality literature. Years went by and often pulp magazines would feature illustrated novel-length stories of heroic characters, such as Flash Gordon and the Phantom Detective. Pulp magazine publisher Martin Goodman created the company later known as Marvel Comics under the name Timely Publications in 1939. Timely Publications would publish various comic books and by 1941 had debuted memorable characters such as the Human Torch and Captain America. The same year Goodman founded Timely Publications, the gentleman would also hire his wife's cousin for his workforce as a general office assistant. This same man became the interim editor of the comic line and an extensive writer under Timely. This man, known as Stanley Lieber, would be known pseudonymously as Stan Lee. Many years later, following some low points for the company during World War II, by 1961, the company, then known as Marvel Comics, writer-editor Stan Lee revolutionised superhero comics by introducing superheroes designed to appeal to older readers than the predominantly child audiences of the medium. Marvel's new comic books broke archetypes of the time, eschewing secret identities in favour of celebrity status. The first of this new breed of superheroes was the Fantastic Four. Another feature that made these comics appealing was that they focused on characterization and adult issues to a greater extent than most superhero comics before them. Even Spider-Man, Marvel's most successful creation yet, would be less two-dimensional than other heroes who came before him, as he was a young hero who suffered from self-doubt and mundane teenage problems, something many readers could identify with. So now, what about the rise of the stars of the game we are heavily covering today? Well, the X-Men would arrive on the scene in a comic book first published in 1963 and was created by artist-slash-co-writer Jack Kirby and writer Stan Lee. As we now know, this would be one of the company's most recognisable and successful franchises. Like many of Marvel's concepts, the X-Men story went deeper than that of a generic superhero. The X-Men are essentially mutants born with superhuman abilities. Their purpose is to fight for peace and equality between both mutants and regular humans, pretty much sending out an anti-bigotry message years before it was mainstream. Like any cultural war, there are heroes and villains on both sides, with Charles Xavier leading the X-Men, who fight for equality, and Magneto, the leader of the Brotherhood of Mutants, who have opposing views and philosophies, believing mutants to be superior. X-Men was probably Marvel's most layered creation yet, and a great storytelling device that could be used to tell various tales featuring all sorts of ethical conundrums. The comic would go on to focus on storylines and themes about prejudice and racism, all of which have persisted throughout the series in one form or another. Even Magneto's character would be humanised later on, when it was unveiled he had developed his hatred for humans due to spending time in Nazi concentration camps during World War II. I was not lying when I mentioned the depth this franchise has. 
Sadly though, none of this was enough and the comic lagged behind in sales in comparison to other Marvel comics like Spider-Man for example. So over the years the comic book would be tweaked and overhauled, featuring various different teams of X-Men, resulting in multiple different peaks and troughs in terms of failures and successes. The Dark Phoenix saga though, constructed in the 1980s, would give the publication the X Factor it needed to finally become Marvel's number one comic book franchise. 1989 would result in a new animated pilot for an X-Men TV show to be made, with the pilot being known as X-Men Pride of the X-Men. The pilot aired infrequently in syndication and was later released on video. Shortly after this pilot was delivered, New World Pictures, who owned the Marvel Entertainment Group, started having financial issues and stopped work on just about everything but Muppet Babies. The pilot of this show received a mixed response from critics and fans, but it delivered enough promise to impress Margaret Loescht, who would go on to become head of Fox Children's Network. Having championed the Pride of the X-Men pilot in 1989, she was quick to set up an order for 13 episodes of X-Men, the hugely popular kids show that would go on to receive 5 very successful seasons. But in regards to the game in question today, it is the humble pilot show known as X-Men Pride of the X-Men that is most relevant to this story. Amusingly, despite the mixed response and not resulting in a TV show for a few years, it would still go on to receive multiple video games based on the short animation. The first of these would appear in 1989, known as X-Men Madness in Murder World. This game released on the Commodore 64, Amiga Computer Range and MS-DOS was created by Paragon Software and was a simple side-scroller with puzzle elements. In the next year, the X-Men would arrive on the Nintendo Entertainment System. In the game, The Uncanny X-Men, released by Bloody LJN. I could make some juvenile jokes like other creators here, but I'm above all that. Anyway, this game got really negative reviews, and some publications of the period even went as far as to call the title the worst superhero game ever made. Ouch. Third time lucky, a good game based on the Pride of the X-Men pilot would finally rise like a phoenix from the Dark Ashes. See what I did there? With of course the delightfully incredible X-Men arcade game, produced by Konami in 1992. Here is footage of me playing on a cabinet I run into when exploring Budapest earlier this week. A feature you may instantly notice about this classic side-scrolling beat-em-up is that the cabinet has enough buttons and joysticks to support a whopping six players, straight away putting the game in very unique territory as far as arcade games go. What an absolutely mammoth machine, eh? The six player version of the cabinet is unusual in that it has two screens with one of them in the usual place for an arcade game and the other in the cabinet below, reflected by a mirror one side of the screen, creating an effect of a single double widescreen setup. Innovative novel stuff. The six playable characters in the game featured are Cyclops, Colossus, Wolverine, Storm, Nightcrawler and Dazzler. These characters are all based on the designs found within the Pride of the X-Men pilot. In this side-scrolling beat-em-up, the goal is simple. Players must make their way through various brightly coloured stages, defeating various nefarious mutant bosses, eventually facing off against Magneto himself. All of which we will cover in more depth shortly. The game features extremely simple controls, mirroring many other popular beat-em-ups of the time. The game's basic control scheme allows the X-Men to attack, jump and use a mutant power, which is basically a one-time use, more powerful move that affects multiple enemies on the screen. Apart from being a limited move, its other drawback is that it causes the user to lose health. Both mutant powers and health can be restored through collecting items. Each character can fight using various combinations of punches and kicks in close combat, but each also has a unique special mutant attack at their disposal, which adds to the game's variety somewhat. The game's introductory sequence features Magneto and a band of sentinels raking havoc on a city. Xavier is watching all of this unfold via a monitor, so orders the X-Men to go save the city. The game starts out with the player, or players, fighting their way through hordes of sentinels on the damaged streets. The surrounding area looks like a war zone, with even police cars completely trashed. 
At the end of this simple stage, a boss fight takes place against Pyro, who confronts the player via jumping out of a hole in the wall. Whilst this stage is not particularly challenging, it whets the player's appetite, giving them a taste of what is to come. The next part of the game takes place in more of a factory setting, instantly forcing the player to face off against pallet swap sentinels and bazooka wielding enemies. The area also features other robotic enemies adding to the factory aesthetic. The boss fight in this area takes place in what looks like a war room featuring a map on the wall. The battle pits players against the Blob, a large imposing foe who proves more of a challenge than the last. Players are then flown to an island to a more jungly island setting, featuring the usual enemies along with the introduction of mutant crocodiles. The area also sees the player needing to defeat giant mutant wasps that emerge from skull-like wall crevices in the background. After a brief confrontation with Magneto, the player jumps to the bottom of a waterfall, facing off against monsters that pop out of the ground, followed up with a boss battle against Wendigo, a character who hilariously keeps announcing his presence. The next stage takes place in a classical beat-em-up cave, because what would be a beat-em-up without a cave, eh? All of the usual enemies appear, but it is a cool touch that some of the sentinels can throw large rocks, a nice nod to the fact that we are in a bloody cave. Not that much to report here outside of a boss fight against Nimrod, another boss encounter adding to the game's overall challenge. Past this point, the characters continue to make their way across the island, navigating rocky terrain across a thin path that features a large storm taking place in the background. As players progress through the game, the amount of obstacles seems to intensify. There are lots of familiar enemies to take on here before reaching the White Queen in yet another boss encounter. The stage doesn't end here though, as huge sentinels begin popping up from the background, delivering the player more enemies to destroy before finally facing off in an encounter with the Juggernaut, bitch. After he is dealt with, the player follows Professor Xavier into a temple, only to be revealed that he was Mystique in disguise, tricking the player into falling down a pit. Naughty naughty. Now on the ground, the player makes their way through a trippy temple-y cavey section featuring psychedelic colours that dance in the background. At the end of the stage, the player faces off against Egyptian mutant enemies before heading off to bloody space. In this stage, which looks very similar to the final stage in Turtles in Time, there are obviously even more waves of enemies than usual to deal with, but the icing on the cake is a bloody boss rush, making players run a gauntlet against every boss from the game, all over again. It is a standard beat em up trope after all, so why the bloody hell not, eh? After dealing with all of these vicious buggers, the player finally faces off against Magneto, or at least who they would think is Magneto, as upon defeating them it is revealed that the opponent was Mystique in disguise once more. Once this battle is won, players can finally face off against the real Magneto, in arguably the toughest fight in the game yet. When he is finally defeated, credits roll, leaving the player to soak in their well-earned victory. X-Men The Arcade Game is a short, sweet and simple game that can usually be beaten in around 30 minutes, but bearing in mind that this is an arcade title, this was the perfect game to play through if gamers had a fair share of cash to burn in quick succession. In just 30 minutes, players could walk away with the satisfaction of knowing they got to experience this great little game, a title that with its sick player functionality is absolutely perfect for the arcade. In fact, it would not surprise me at all if the game's shortness paired with its huge multiplayer selling point were the main reasons as to why we never got this one in the home. The game just bloody wigs of the arcade, and the game would have had to have been severely tampered with and changed about quite a bit to deliver a worthy console experience. I personally think the diversity in the six playable character designs, the varied environments, colourful bosses and six player functionality make this Konami's greatest arcade beat-em-up. Sure, the Simpsons and Turtles arcade games are great, but this one brings an extra level of insanity along for the ride. Most people who played this one in its original arcade run have fond memories to share regarding playing the game, and for this reason alone the title will always be considered one of the all-time greats. Players loved it both then and now for a reason, and the game will live on in people's hearts for a long time to come. 
Due to this popularity, the game even went on to eventually receive a home release, receiving a HD port of the game created by Backbone Entertainment and released by Konami on the PlayStation Network and Xbox Live Arcade on December the 14th, 2010. Those that purchased this game had just as much fun as the first time around, and IGN summarizes the scenario perfectly when they wrote, The game is incredibly simple and repetitive, and yet it works. It's simply a blast to play with threads. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was the mad story of the X-Men arcade game, an all-time great beat-em-up and arcade title, and probably one of the best of its kind. No game offers frantic six-player fun like this one. If you enjoyed today's video, I upload multiple videos a week like this covering gaming history for you to watch and indulge in. Make sure you like this video, subscribe and leave your thoughts down below on what you thought of today's content. I would love to know what you have to say. Finally, my channel is partially funded by the generous donations I receive via Patreon. Patrons can earn a credit and a shout at the end of these videos and producer credits at the beginning. These people make working full time on YouTube just that little bit easier. So I'd like to thank you all very much for that. Huge shout outs go out to Carl Johnson, Sebastian Veles, Sponge Matt B, House of the Ted, JD Robbins, Synth Spaces, Andrew Bazansky, Asobi Quang DX, Michael Baker, Tom Elliott, Computer Man, Antonio Rodriguez, Craig Jenkins, Daniel Daly, Retroversing.com, Dan Barlow Jr., and Joel. And all of the other patrons who support this show. Yeah.